No, I don't know. I guess you're back. Mm -hmm. your, 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 your mute is on. Okay. Go back. Welcome to another episode of the Caribbean Edge. Um, we are thankful for another day and we have a panel of guests on the Caribbean Edge today that we will introduce to you. However, we want to start tonight off in prayer, so I'm going to ask Dr. Rupert Francis to lead us off in prayer. Thank you. Almighty Father, bless our land. Guide us with thy mighty hand. Father, we gather here today to reflect on the death of a brother, George Floyd, and his family, and the many brothers and sisters who died at the hands of the police and their families. We pray that you speak to the hearts and minds of the many persons of all races, walks of life, and creeds nationally and internationally who have come together in solidarity to act so that the scourge can be lifted out of our presence. Please bless every participant here today. Give them words of wisdom and understanding that we will speak of and that can offer comfort where it is needed and provide clarity now and the way forward. We ask these and other mercies in thy mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Rupert Francis. We also have joining us tonight, um, candidate for state senator, Ms. Daphne Campbell. Thank you and welcome to the Caribbean Edge. Such a pleasure to have you tonight. Thank you for having me. You want me to introduce myself now or not? You sure can. Go right ahead. Well, okay. For those who don't know me, I'm Senator Daphne Campbell. I was uh, in Tallahassee for eight years, six years in the House, and two years in the Senate. And in the Senate, I was the first, uh, you know, Caribbean woman in the Senate. And uh, I serve uh, the um, constituency of North Miami, North Miami, North Miami, Miami Shores, Biscayne, uh, park and uh, El Portel for eight years. And now I'm running for State Senate District 35. You know, this is 35 encompasses, not Miami, not Miami Beach, Biscayne uh, Garden, Opalaka, Miami Garden, the entire Myanmar, Pimble Pines, Pimble Park, West Park, Hollywood and Hollywood. And I'm here to speak on behalf of what's going on right now as a legislature for past eight years. And during my tenure in Tallahassee, I did have bill against gun violence, and I have bill in favor of uh, law enforcement as well. I was talking to the chief earlier before we started, and I said, you know, where I have a bill HB 41 for law enforcement hall of fame. I do know what happened is bad, but it's not all officers bad. It's just one bad apple from the good apple. So uh, we will discuss later on. And thank you for having me and welcome everyone on the panel and the discussion will start soon. This is again, Senator Daphne Campbell, candidate for Senate District 35, which is Dave and Broward. Thank you so much for that. We're so glad to have you and all your experience as well that you can share with us throughout this conversation. And obviously we wish you all the best as well. Thank you. Um, Next, we have Chief of Police of Alada Hill. So glad to have you, Ms. Constance Stanley. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, I can, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually, I've uh, been with the Lauder Hill uh, Police Department since 1994. Um, I heard Daphne mention earlier that she's covering an area that I worked for for three years before coming to the city of Lauder Hill, and that's the Opalaka Police Department. Uh, so I served uh, there as an officer for three years before coming here. Um, I've been in law enforcement for a total of 29 years. Um, uh, been the chief of police uh, for, that would be five years actually, uh, this August. Um, so I am happy uh, to be here. Um, I want to first give my condolences, um, you know, to the family of uh, Mr. George Floyd. Um, my heart goes out to the family. Um, 
And what happened to him, um, my, very devastating to us in law enforcement, as Daphne mentioned earlier, um, one bad apple uh, should not spoil a whole bunch, um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with that term. Um, but there are a lot of uh, decent officers out there, uh, very good officers, and there are some stories that they have that don't get uh, told, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but I've worked up the ranks. I started out, out as a police officer. Um, I always wanted to be a police officer growing up as a kid. And uh, I don't have my mother and father right now, but one of the things that stopped me um, initially was my mother. Uh, my mother was uh, in fear of me joining this, possession, this position uh, because, uh, or getting in this profession, I'm sorry, because she feared uh, for my safety. Um, unfortunately, I lost her um, in 91 and um, she wanted me to be a nurse. And uh, this is something that I always wanted to get to <laughs> you shaking your head, Marla. Uh, something that I always wanted to to get into, and I, I'm very passionate about it. Love to to help people, so I decided to, to make that leap. Um, my father, who was alive at the time, my mother passed, um, unfortunately, and I just um, you know I, I went ahead and pursued it. Um, my father attended my graduation, and I remember one of the things he said to me: um, "You know, your mom didn't want you to do this." I say, "I know, Dad, but I know she's looking down, smiling." So. Uh, you know, from that point on, I went up through the ranks, uh, became an officer, uh, sergeant, lieutenant, um, major, um, and then uh, police chief. So I worked through several ranks um, in the agency. I've trained officers. I worked on professional standards, uh, various uh, areas within the agency. Um, so pretty well-rounded, and that's really what's needed um, to run an agency. So I'm proud of that, proud of this city. Uh, we have some awesome, awesome officers here. Um, the city is uh, located in Broward County, uh, for those who are not familiar with Lauder Hill. Uh, we have about 132 sworn officers uh, right now, um, still have some available openings. So if anybody's interested in joining this profession, please do so. Um, one of my reasons and passions for getting involved was uh, my family and including myself. Uh, we had been subjected to you know, police, um, I wouldn't say brutality, but you know, unprofessionalism. And um, that was one of the reasons, another reason why I felt that I needed to join this profession so I could be a change agent. So again, I'm happy to have this opportunity to speak to you. Um, you know, uh, what is happening now is something that's necessary. And I just say people have a, uh, have a right to be angry. They have a right to be upset. Um, I can speak for myself and several in law enforcement profession, those who are great officers, um, this hurts them as well. And it is a black eye for the law enforcement profession. Uh, but again, um, there are a lot of good deeds and we don't want this one incident, uh, which was murder. Um, and I heard you, Daphne, say earlier that, you know, again, if it was somebody else out in the streets, they would have been in custody. So, you know, let's call it what it is. And that's what it was. So, you know, to sit there and look at that, the video, you know, hear the, 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 the cry out, you know, uh, from that, per it, it just, it, anyone with a heart, um, they have to be impacted by this. So I'm happy to share um, some of the things that we're doing here in the city of Lauderhill, as well as the type of training and, um, you know, also, you know, be uh, welcome to have questions, you know, come in and just talk about how we do things uh, here in the city. So, you know, it's important to have that dialogue. We need to have, you know, a continuous dialogue. And that's, you know, with everybody involved, you know, it has to be a joint and collective effort. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be part of uh, making things better. So again, I appreciate you inviting me on the show. Thank you, and thank you for your service. I think it's so, I'm so thankful that you joined because the police are under so much scrutiny right now, and rightly so. What happened was horrific, um, but hearing a different side to it certainly will give us food for thought, so to speak. Um, we all know that not every police officer is bad, but seeing someone like you that has worked yourself up through the ranks and that has come on to be vulnerable to, to the public and answer questions. When a lot of people are taking the back seat, a lot of leaders are not coming forward and speaking. So for everyone on this panel, including yourself, thank you and thank you for your service, especially you. for being a strong woman. <laughs> it cannot be easy working with so many men and so many different personalities. <laughs> thank That's been you. been but stay in the course. Thank you. You are. Dr. Rupert Francis. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to commend those strong ladies that are on this panel, including yourself, because it is very important that the women 
um, you know, come forward and show their strength. I believe in the strength of a woman because my mother was such a woman, although she did not have the educational prerequisites that people may require, she made, it, made me the person that I am today. I also want to take the opportunity to welcome the gentlemen who haven't spoken yet, but I know them very well. Um, erstwhile gentleman, and I, in fact, I supported Mr. Marlon Hill's uh, first uh, move out, and um, still there, saw the picture the other day, and um, Judge Hemmings, uh, you know, I have to say, lift my hat to him, because he's a Jamaican par excellence, and he has shown the way for our young people. I want to also say my deepest condolences to the family of the um, George Floyd, and I also want to say that I myself, uh, just to finish a quick history, I was in the Jamaica Defense Force uh, mm. before I became, I came to the United States. I rose to the rank of captain. I won't tell you how many years ago. And then um, I was the military police chief at the t um, for a while down there as a company commander and an adjutant. Then I came to the United States and I went into education and I got all these uh, degrees so that I can call myself a doctor, captain doctor now. Um, and hopefully you do not mean to, to turn me into a pastor by me making that um, initial <laughs> prayer. All right, now the, what I would like to say is that this whole matter is a deep-seated matter, historically. And this pain is coming from a long, uh, you know, many hundreds of years. And it's now manifested. I, I watched several progressions of this. I watched, um, you know, people from way back when Marcus Garvey, I listened to, you know, the various, you know, erstwhile black men, and of course, people who supported um, our growth in the, the, the United States, now that I'm a citizen as well. Um, I, I can say that they did. And, and, and I listened to all of them. And the, the underlying theme was, we have to fight for our rights. We have to stand up for our rights or else they'll be taken away from us. I think that somewhere along the line, we got comfortable with all of these things that are happening. The police is there to protect and serve. And I being a military policeman myself, I can tell you that was our mantra as well. And I know the job is not easy. I know it's not easy because you're dealing with human beings. But at the same time, you know, we have to focus on a lot more training, education, and giving them the experience that they need. Some of the persons that, and some persons are just coming in there for the wrong reasons. There are more good cops than there are bad cops out there, okay? And we just need to seriously have the laws with teeth to protect the, the, the people that they're coming in contact with. They need to learn new, better communication skills, for example. I talk to um, Chief Stanley. I talk to people are in the law enforcement. And my God, I, I, I could sit down for a day and speak with them because, you know, they, they understand. But unfortunately, there are a few, few people who give the whole place a bad name. Now, in respect to the marches, um, yes, they are necessary. But what is unnecessary is destroying something that you did not build. Tears came to my eyes, to be quite honest with you, when I saw a number of Black-owned businessmen cry and beg them not to burn down their buildings. I happen to be very close to many um, officers, law enforcement officers, including um, Andrew Smalling, who's running for Broward Sheriff in the uh, upcoming um, elections. And, uh, and I'm telling you, these are decent people because I run, I'm the head of the um, Crime Intervention and Prevention Task Force for the U.S. Canada and the U.K. And I'm telling you this, they are wonderful, wonderful people out there. But let me stop at that, because we need to have a bomb in Gilead. We need to come back to the table. We need for the, our people who are representing us to represent us really fully to make sure that these laws are followed by everyone and no one is above the law. Thank you. Thank you for joining the panel and for your prayer, opening prayer, and for your words as well. We look forward to the healthy conversation ahead at some of the issues you brought up as well. I'm going to move on to um, Judge Norman Hemming. Thank you so much for joining us. I can tell you a little bit about him because I know him socially from a social distance, so to speak. 
Um, but one of the nicest men you'll ever see out makes you laugh, make you smile while educating and entertaining you. Definitely a friend to a lot in the community. So I was so honored that you accepted the request to come on the show tonight and to share your experience and your love for us as a community. Dawn, thank you so very much for having me on here this evening. I'm just humbled that I can be in the same company as all the other August guests uh, that you have here. And I can't wait to hear the questions that those members of the audience would like to ask. The only thing that I'll say is this, um, a number of people have been emailing me since the show started asking, how do they get on to the Caribbean edge to listen to the show? So perhaps <laughs> let me know that so I can reply. Well, to one of the things you can do is also share it on your page so that you can, they can see it there. Uh, um, if everyone takes a minute to share, you can, anyone on your page can see it. I've also been silently accepting people as they join the Caribbean edge. I was trying to get them to do it earlier, but as oh, I yeah. see them pop up, I'll, I'll approve it. Awesome, awesome. Great. And uh, my condolences, of course, to the family of uh, George Floyd. Uh, these are some, these are the best of times and the worst, but I think great things are going to come out of what's happening uh, right now, as crazy as that sounds, right? Uh, African Americans, it was announced uh, two days ago in the New York Times that um, adult African Americans um, less than half of them are, are employed since the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, they are a disproportionate number, some 38% of African Americans are representative of the prison population here in the United States, which is very um, disconcerting, considering that they make up approximately 13% of the um, American um, population. They're more, more likely, 2.5 times more likely to die of COVID-19 than any other population in the United States. They uh, make up a disproportionate uh, number of people in public housing. Uh, they um, are, unfortunately are, are the ones um, who are 2.5 times as likely to be killed in a, with an interaction with uh, a law enforcement um, organization. And the only area it seems, well, one of the few areas in which it seems that we're winning is that we have, we're overrepresented um, in the number of people who are who call themselves Christians in the United States. So I can't wait for this exciting discussion here this, this evening because I'm also an ordained minister. Thanks. <laughs> and I knew that. <laughs> okay, and Mr. Marlon Hill, such a pleasure to have you back on the Caribbean edge. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we can't see you on the Caribbean edge and not say hi to your beautiful wife, Ms. Carla Hill. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, Don, for having me, and um, welcome to all the listeners um, locally and across the world. <clears throat> it's always a great pleasure to see women in leadership. You know, Senator Campbell, uh, always great to see your effervescent face. Um, Chief Stanley, been following your career. Um, I don't care what anyone says, but I think it, it makes a huge difference when a young person or someone in the community can walk up and to see their chief look Chief Stanley. Um, whatever you want to take that for, um, a woman and a chief, um, in my opinion, has an impact on people's mental state and mindset. Um, I currently, I practice law in Miami, um, and I'm also a candidate for County Commission, Miami County Commission, um, District 9, um, a County Commissioner, um, has tremendous oversight and input on policies related to the Miami-Dade Police Department. I think it's very important for the listeners tonight to really understand the context of where they live, um, um, whether in South Florida. Um, I'm sure that this evening, Dawn, we all have various emotions that are running through our minds and our hearts, um, whether it's sadness, whether it's disappointment, um, frustration, anger, um, rage, um, depression, um, lack of hope. Um, but even with all of those emotions, Don, I want to say tonight that we are not powerless. Um, uh, we have power over waking up um, and deciding what type of emotion we will want to embrace each day. And more importantly, we do have power over deciding what types of laws and policies that impact our local communities, whether it be the city of Lauderhill, whether it be the city of Miami Beach, whether it be Miami-Dade County, Broward County, 
wherever you live. So one of the things I definitely want to encourage the viewers tonight is have you picked up the phone and called your chief and asked her um, whether or not she has sent out a communication to her rank and file as to what the use of force policy is for the department. Um, have you called your chief to even ask her, how are you doing today, chief? Can you tell me how you um, how are you doing today? Because they are not robots. They are real people, just like um, you and I, and they have emotions as well. So the last thing I would say in closing is that we also have a contract with each other as citizens and residents and just as humans under the laws of the Constitution and the way in which we are supposed to respect and treat each other under the law. Sometimes we cross the line of the law, both citizens and police officers, and there's a certain level of accountability that we have to ascribe to to meet this, this constitutional contract that we have with each other in treating each other with respect, dignity, and just the right to breathe. So I'm hoping tonight we can maybe come up with some practical solutions as to how we honor the names of individuals who, um, who have been killed in different instances, different circumstances. Um, I'll be tra tragically, um, we will look at different cases um, as to how we avoided, unfortunately, the loss of life, which at the end of the day, everyone wants to live and everyone wants to be able to breathe. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Marlon. So condolences to George Floyd's family. He left behind a six-year-old daughter. And, and I want to say it broke my heart to see her yes. on the shoulders of a family friend saying, my dad changed the world. And she repeated that six times. My dad changed the world. My dad changed the world. And her innocence in that, and if you haven't seen it, you have to look it up. The innocence of a six-year-old daughter left without a dad. Mm. Um, even though, you know, Marlon mentioned this a little bit, it's definitely a turning point for us here in America and around the world. Because you see it around the world where a lot of people are are, are, are taking the knee, uh, protesting. There's a difference between protesting and looting. So we do need to clarify that. Um, we can't have this conversation without starting out by talking about COVID-19. Um, it's on every parent's mind as our children are out there protesting for something that they believe in. And even though these protested grew to this magnitude with you know, Mr. Floyd's death, there were several deaths before that. There were several treatments, mistreatments of other humans. I mean, who has not been stopped by a police officer and mm -hmm. feared for their life? And unless you have experienced that, I don't think you can fully understand it. As much as you hear it and you see it, when you feel it, it's a huge difference. And I was personally stopped by a police officer and it was not a good police officer. It was at 4 a.m. in the morning driving and he practically ran me off the road. I had the instinct to call 911. I told very few friends about it because I was so shaken at the time about it. He came up to my window with his gun drawn, yelling and screaming. I was going 35 miles per hour, in a 35 mile per hour zone. I was probably going less than that. On the way to meet my boss to go to a conference, a working mom. So that incident, when I call the police and say, someone's following me, someone's trying to run me off the road, I had no idea it was a police officer right here in Broward County. And when he came up, I said, I have 911 on the phone. And that's when, he, and I looked down and saw his gun and he backed away. And I said to the 911 operator, he has a gun in his hand. And he did not put on his recording until he was moving back because I asked for a copy of that recording. So I say this to start the conversation with, 
the fear that we live with. Did I file a police complaint? Absolutely. Someone came to my home. They sat with me. They, they chose their words very carefully and said they understood. And, and through this, they came to meet with me a couple of days later. I was still crying over the incident. But what I was thankful for was that I was on the phone with 911. He screamed and yelled at me after and let me go. I was at his mercy in tears for no reason, absolutely none. I was thankful I was alive. I was thankful I wasn't beaten. I was thankful that it wasn't my children who may not have called 911 in fear for their lives. So it is real, the fear that we feel. So um, I know they're good cops, <laughs> we've said it. Um, I don't even know if the complaint went in its file. So my question is, when these situation happens, as regular citizens, we don't know what to do. What is our recourse other than filing a complaint that may or may not go anywhere? Uh, can I answer? Uh, first, um, at, at the beginning, I didn't elaborate too much on the incident because you said to introduce yourself. I have first had to uh, send condolences to the family. This is um, the situation, I'm gonna answer your questions uh, later, and I heard you too, and I have incidents just not the same like you, but almost the same. Um, let me say something, when I watch what's going on with George Flood, and I have three boys, wow. I was crying like a baby. Mm. I said to myself, how in the world, in a plain view like this, for someone to kneel down on somebody's neck where your all your arteries, you know, is there, and then you have your hands in your pocket, very calm, and the man is begging, 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 call even mama. Huh? And then you don't do nothing and he died when Pamela came, find out he already passed away. Everybody knows, I don't know if you don't know, I'm a registered nurse by trade. I be, I've been a nurse over 30 years and I work in critical care. And not only when they find out what the guy dead, a judge already passed away dead. And the officer have all his nerve, get away with it. He wasn't handcuffed. They didn't call him for questioning. They didn't call the other three for questioning. They all went home and they have to, the, the reason he got arrested as a third degree felony, not even first, third degree felony, okay? So because of protests, because of looting, because of, you know, our people is mad and because of all these, you know, like uh, 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 angry people and, you know, things happening. To me, I said, they didn't need to wait for a protest at all for the men to get arrested. If it was somebody else who did something like that, why right on the spot they handcuff you? They don't, even you're not arrested, but they will handcuff you to question you what is going on. What's wrong with the officers, with the state of attorney over there to wait for so long to do one arrest and three of them still free, not arrested yet. So this is the problem we're having right now. I'm, like I said earlier, it's not all officers bad. It's not all, you know, like a police department. But as the same token, the fear is there in the community. Because I remember I was a state representative. And my, I live where I live. I moved there since 1987 from New York to Miami. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened. The officer in that area that was in North Miami stopped going in the area and the kids grew up in the house they grew up in the area and police came in front of my yard in front of the door so the kids standing there handcuffed them to search them i have to go to the chief and say listen you guys not going to start any foolishness in this area because i lived there for so long the kids grew up there you guys need to stop so they have to put something on the computer and to stop the situation because I was a state representative. What about if I wasn't? 
What about for somebody who don't have, who cannot voice for themselves? What about someone who cannot, who have no relationship with the chief to call and say, this is the situation in my area. So that means these kids will be arrested for nothing. And after that, they will make up a story on the paperwork for them say they were doing something while they were standing in front of their door. Basically, the fear, you know, the, um, with the gaps between police and community, um, uh, community involvement is a huge issue. The safety of the, you know, like uh, of the people is a huge issue, but it could be corrected. It could be, you know, uh, it could change. It could be changed by, you know, we working with the officers, we working with the um, with the police department, and at the state level, make laws to train. I, I said it earlier, and I'm saying it again. I think we still need laws in place to train the officers how to treat people. Period. Regardless, you committed a crime. Regardless, until you're proven guilty, you need to be treated fairly. Secondly, secondly, we as a registered nurse, doctors, um, I don't know if the lawyers have CEUs. We have continuing education every two years before we give the, they give us their license. I believe the officers need some continuing education to know when somebody mental. When somebody not mental, how to treat people on the street to make people like a fairness, you know, at least alleviate it because we cannot continue with this, this treatment with blacks. Every time something happens, it's white and black, white and black, racism, racism, racism. And we are taxpayers. Who paying the police officers? Taxpayers. It cannot work. Something needs to be done. And we need to live in a place where we feel safe. We need to be on the street where we feel safe, especially when you send your kids. And George Floyd is not only one. You have other people things happen to. What about the one who was jogging and then he was he was killed for not doing anything, didn't have no 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 gun, nothing. So this discussion is very huge and we have to know, and I'm glad the chief is there, and I know she has a lot to uh, to share with us, but this discussion needed on a daily basis because the, the community, the gap between the police and the community, I think we need to do a lot about that. Thank okay. you, Ms. Campbell. So Chief right. Stanley, can you tell us as citizens that we feel that we've been abused, you know, especially in a traffic stop, what can we do? What's our rights? Okay, first of all, we have policies and procedures in place and um, something as mere as asking a, an officer their name to provide that to you. Um, so they don't, that can uh, warrant a complaint. But if you feel you were mistreated, um, and as I say, my background, I worked in professional standards for a number of years at Opalaka and when I came to uh, the city of Lauderhill. So if someone feels that they were mistreated, you can go to the Internal Affairs Division, make that complaint. Uh, sometimes people may be in fear and feeling that that would not uh, resolve an issue and you can go to the state attorney's office and it would trickle down uh, that way. But you have uh, several options. So um, what I encourage, and I'm glad you did in this case, uh, you know, follow through with calling 911. The officers, there are body cameras that our officers do have. Uh, so we can review those if there is an issue, um, you know, where you say uh, that, you know, if there are any uh, uh, witnesses. Um, next to you, but you know, we were able to track those, we're able to track the officer's vehicles, we're able to review those body cameras so we can determine whatever information you're providing, we'll have that to, to review. Um, the officers do have rights um, when they come in. In other words, we have to read them their rights because if we are going to find them at fault for something, uh, it makes sanction discipline, it could be an up to an, a termination depending on the seriousness of the uh, offense. But I do want to encourage people if you feel you were mistreated, by all means come in and make that complaint. Um, again, an officer, that, that complaint, there may be, and just let me give you an example. So you may have, it's just you and that officer. You don't have any body camera. It's your word against theirs. But sometimes you may have that same officer. He's getting the same complaint about being rude, but it's just you and that person. So they have to, you know, if they don't have any other factors, but yes, your statement, they may not be able to sustain that investigation. But when you start looking at a pattern, you know, something wrong, if you continue to have people uh, filing that complaint. So that's why I do encourage people. I've done it before as a civilian and as an officer. I filed complaints where I saw that officers were, were rude, as I mentioned before. 
several of my family members have been exposed um, to mistreatment. And it shouldn't take you to mention your position um, before someone does. And I had to pull out my ID as a police officer because I knew what my rights were. Um, but again, it should not have gotten to that point. But I just encourage people to strongly report, you know, any type of abuse or mistreatment. Sometimes people may not, you know, feel that they didn't, um, shouldn't deserve, you know, have, shouldn't have received the ticket that they got. Um, there are options there too. But again, if you feel that you were treated unprofessional, by all means, make sure you file that complaint with the Internal Affairs Division. Um, I know you mentioned about community, um, you know, programs and networking with the community. Uh, we do have a lot of community programs, and the reason we do that is for the community to get to know us. Sometimes we express some of these options that they have because people do have a lot of questions and don't know certain processes. We have a Citizens Academy. That's a 16 week course where we go through these process, how to go about filing a complaint, you know, how traffic stops are conducted so people can understand their rights. Uh, but that option is there. And I just say, let everybody take advantage of making sure they follow through and do that. Uh, once we conclude an investigation, um, something is sent out advising the outcome of the investigation. So the person's not just waiting to say, hey, I filed this and, and I don't have a response. I know you mentioned that you didn't hear anything back and you don't know if it went in their file, but it does. Uh, there's a case number generated. Um, we identify whatever policy violation it is. Um, and then we follow up with uh, someone who made the complaint. Sometimes they may want to just talk to a supervisor. Um, but yes, I encourage people to make sure they follow through with the department. Body cams are so important and the cameras on the vehicle. This happened to me like three years ago. So I'm hoping that that changed because from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the officer has control over when they start that body cam, correct? Mm. They do. We have policies in place like so if they're dispatched to a certain call when they get into a certain area that body camera would automatically activate. Um, but yes, they can. So, but if, if they do that, we'll find out. So, you know, there are uh, sanctions in place that they don't follow policy and procedure when it comes to the body camera. And I'm going to ask everyone to just limit responses to just in the essence of time to two, three minutes. Um, Marlon, Judge Hemin. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I, I'm saddened to hear that you, you, you had that experience, Dawn, and, and you also had the emotion of fear in your interaction with a police officer. And, and that's part of the problem, right? Why should, we, why should we have a fear in interaction with any professional, right? So there's mm -hmm. obviously a broken piece, um, something broken about that relationship that we have to mend, just like what Senator Campbell said. We have to work on the relationship that the citizen of any particular locale has with the police department. It's something that we have to nurture, like any relationship, whether it's a, a marriage, whether it's an employer-employee, whether it's a teacher-student, every relationship um, has, has elements of being healthy. And obviously, the relationship between police departments, police officers, and communities across America, there's something broken about it. Um, because um, some negative things keep happening and recurring. And folks are very upset that it keeps happening more often than not that look at the people on this panel. Right? So this relationship there is broken, not that it doesn't happen to people that don't look up like on this panel. So um, Chief is correct. You know, we have policies and standards, mm -hmm. but there's something deeper here that is, that is pushing persons that are in roles, professional roles, to break the rules of their policies and standards against certain persons in our, in our society. So the contract and the relationship is broken, and we have to do better to rebuild that trust so that whenever a police officer does pull me over or does come to my home, I don't start getting cold sweats and feeling that the worst is about to happen. That something is not right about that emotion with interacting with a person that's a very important professional role in our society. So, uh, yeah, so I, I really appreciate the remarks of everyone. Just, just to let you know this, that there's an answer actually. There, there's a 116 point plan uh, page plan that's out there that was put, it's called 21st Century um, Policing. But I think it's, it's, it's apropos that uh, Dawn, that you're holding your show on this day, on the third day of June, because it's the same date as the day on which Anthony Burns, a slave, was arrested in the year 1854. He was arrested as a runaway slave. And why that's important to what we're discussing here today is that, in, that apartments have their origin um, in, um, in two different areas. 
one in the south, southern United States in 1707. They were initially created as slave patrols to go about and arrest um, slaves who, were, who had run away. And then also in the year 1838, a separate um, wing of police departments was formed in Boston. So it's interesting because Anthony Burns ran away from the South to Boston. And, and it's in Boston that one of these slave patrols, one of these policing agencies arrested him, right? And, and, and were demanding that he be extradited to his home to remain a slave. And, and so I bring it up for this reason, for a number of reasons. One is that you, you, you can't, no, no amount of legislation is going to correct the evil heart of, of someone. However, understanding the historical context in which our police departments, and there, by the way, are some 18,000 policing agencies in the United States at the federal, state, and municipal level, and 19,000 approximate policing districts, right? So, um, so when we think about, we can't talk about it as a monolith. Um, however, this is the answer. Th this six um, point pillar plan that's found in the 21st century policing plan that was put out by the Justice Department that I had a chance to work on while I was with the Department of Justice um, is something that's extant, but it's no longer being used, unfortunately, by the current uh, Department of Justice. But it's something that any mayor, any police chief, and by the way, it was created by the National Association of Chiefs of Police in, in, in concert with our business leaders in concert with politicians like state, like the state senator, and in concert with the legal community, and so it's a plan that tried to garner to put together everything so that they could understand what was going on. Now, let me just give you something quick. I know we're limited in time, but one of the one of the six pillars that 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 the plan deals with is something that's called building trust and legitimacy. And the and the police chief touched on this for, for a moment. And it's something that every police department um, should do. So it's changing the, 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 the mindset of police departments from their origin, back in slavery or back in um, Boston as uh, catering to commercial interests, to being no longer being warriors, but being seeing themselves as guardians, first and foremost. Right? Secondly, it talks about have the police departments, all these 18,000 agencies having a cultural transparency. So there's nothing hidden, right? There's no thin blue light by which people are hiding. Um, and then thirdly, it says to have positive um, non-law enforcement interactions between the police departments and the local community, because it helps to break down the sense of uh, distrust. That's why we, and the chief does this in her own area. She, she has what's called uh, coffee with a cup, with a cup, right? Where you go to a Starbucks, or you go to a local coffee um, place, and you meet up with a detective, you meet up with the chief of police, meet up with different law enforcement officers, and you interact with them as a community member outside of this negative uh, criminal interaction. So you get a chance to see what Marlon was talking about, that these people are people just like us. And then lastly, as a part of that first pillar of the plan, it talks about having a diverse police force as being essential to making sure that we don't have situations like we had in uh, Minneapolis. And this is just one of the, one of the pillars that I, I'm giving a very brief overview. It's so in depth, we don't have enough time on the program to do it. But there is an answer and, and, and there are things that we can do and we can have some more discussions um, on that as we go forward. And by the way, Don, um, George Floyd had also had a son, an African-American son who is alive and, and well. Not only his six-year-old daughter, who, who all of us love and were brokenhearted when we saw her speak, but he also has an adult son. Wow. But Judge Norman, yes. Judge Norman, let me ask you a question. Yes. Okay. You're talking about building trust yes. between police officers and the communities. Yes. But to build the trust... Yes. And, 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 and I saw a lot of officers doing coffee with the community. They, they hang out with them. They play basketball. They do all type of things. They're dancing with them, all this. But do you think, because what happened now, I, I was telling the, the, the chief earlier, yes. you know, I don't want everybody to think all officers are bad. Because no. it's not all. You know, there are bad officers, there are bad nurses, bad doctors, bad judges too. Bad <laughs> judges too. You know that. Some of them, you know, you go to them as long as you're black and they send you straight to prison for so many years. You know that. But what I'm saying right now, <laughs> what do you think as a judge, as a sitting judge, and you have experienced by treating people, you don't treat people by color, you treat by 
you know, whatever they have done wrong, fairness. What do you think we need right now to alleviate the fairness of the people? Because once you're black, you know, you always fear something gonna happen to you. You can, you know, why not parents even scared to buy a nice car to their son and their daughter because they are gonna stop them. Like my daughter told me one night at three o'clock in the morning, she was driving, going, coming home, and uh, I believe, you know, she said one of her lights, she didn't have it on. And the officer stopped her, why didn't go out? The officer said, you know, I could arrest you right now. She said, well, officer, what did I do? He said, you don't have to do anything I could have. And she said, well, do you know my mom is so, so, and so? I said, don't call my name. <laughs> but um, she started calling a friend she knows who's a police officer, who are uh, a sheriff, and she put them on the phone, and he heard them loud, and he said to her, you could go. She didn't do nothing at all. Then her light wasn't on. So with that said, what can we as a community end with the police officer, well, like right now we have the chief, you know, on the panel. What can we do to alleviate this fairness on, you know, for the people? Please, I want to hear that from you as a judge. I'm glad you asked that. There are a number of things that we can do, and part of it comes out of the plan that's here. But here's one thing that we can do um, initially. One of, the, one of the reasons that I got involved with, the, with this plan is that I was um, helping to mentor and teach young children at a school in Overtown. And this little six-year-old boy, the same age as George Floyd's uh, daughter, while I was reading a book with him, there were two police cars passed by. He stopped focusing on the reading that I was doing, probably because I was boring. But, and then he turned toward the officer's cars as they were passing by. He did his fingers like this, put two of his fingers together, and he went bang, bang, bang. I stopped the reading right then and started to talk with him about what it is well, what, what caused him to have that visceral reaction to police officers? And why was it that he had that thought? And, and in talking with him, then in being able to speak with his parents, we were able to put in place, Chief, as you may be very well aware, a plan that, that, that went national, that part of that plan was that we had officers from different law enforcement agencies reading to these children so that these same children in Overtown no longer were pointing their fingers together, shooting in an ear shooting, that is, at, at the officers, but had a chance to hear and have officers sitting beside them, reading story time with them, playing games with them. But in addition to that, it's more comprehensive than that. It's not just these officers coming and playing games. It's not just these officers mentoring um, students. Uh, but a big part of the problem is that we have to get every segment of society involved. So we reached out to the private sector. We got the private sector involved. We got people and Marlon Hill, by, by the way, this man is a, is, a, is a maverick. Marlon Hill went out and in that same community uh, had his law firm, one of the leading uh, black owned and operated law firms in the United States, adopt a school, put in place um, uh, uh, a legal clinic in the school, build out a courtroom in the school for mock trials in the school. At the same time, we had other not-for-profit organizations doing other things in the community, going out and teaching parenting skills in, um, in the community. We had um, put in place a, 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 um, a training for law enforcement officers, it's sensitivity training in Broward County, right, in West Palm Beach. It's, there's an organization that the chief will tell you about, it's called the Law Enforcement Coordinating Committee. So when we met together with the Law Enforcement Coordinating Committee from Key West all the way up to Fort Pierce, we had all of these chiefs of police together. And we said to them, this is what we need to put in place for each of our departments. It's voluntary, right? You, we can't enforce it um, on you, but these are the types of things that you need to do. Many of these chiefs came together and started doing that um, of their own volition. Some of them, it had to be imposed on them. Like for instance, the city of Miami had a, um, a consent decree that was entered into between the Department of Justice on them to make sure that they were doing the right thing. And I'm not pointing out to demand because they're bad or worse than anyone else. They're not, right? I'm just saying, these are the types of things that have to be done. So it's, it's the church getting involved, right? It's the, 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 law, the, law, the legal community. It's the law enforcement community getting involved. It's business leaders getting um, involved. It's every arm of the society. It's sitting down with the leadership of Black Lives Matter, which is what we did at the Department of Justice. It is sitting down with with the Muslim community. And, and on the day that we're about to execute search warrants at a mosque, 
we get on the phone with the leaders, the main leaders in the, in, in the, in the Muslim community here in South Florida, and we tell them, listen, we, want, we need to have a meeting. And when they come in for the meeting, we tell them we're about to carry out a search and an arrest um, at one of your mosques, and we identify the mosque, but it's already going on. But we instruct the FBI um, officers to remove their shoes. When Can you believe that? It's that type of sensitivity, that type of understanding that needs to be done. But it, it, it's 18,000 separate law enforcement organizations. It's going to take time, but we're going to get it done. And I believe that Anthony Burns, on this day, June 3rd, in 1854, just like on this day, June 3rd, 2020, we've come a far away, but we have a much farther way to go. But we need everybody involved. And that's where you play such a critical role, um, role State Senator. You can make a tremendous difference on the political wing of things. Yourself at Barnard Hill, I can't wait. Judge Henry, let me ask you. Judge Henry, let me ask you. Florida and adulation. Go Thank ahead, you, Marlon. I wanted to ask you this question, though. Yes. The question has to do with what, what has brought us here with, with protests and demonstrations all across the world, Toronto, Paris, yes. and Fort Lauderdale. It's all over, right? Yes. Thing and racism put in the same pot is a possible problem, right? Um, and we have to admit that um, and your Department of Justice uh, would also admit that the research shows that persons with melanin in their skin uh, have more negative incidences yeah. to the proportion of the number in the population, right? right? We're in this COVID-19 period, and I was asking myself the other day, how do we stop the spread of the virus? What do we do to stop the spread of the virus? If racism was a virus, just like COVID, what, what are some of the things that we're doing to stop the spread? Good point. Washing your hands. Yes. Sanitizing. Yes. Ask, right? Even the debate of having civilian oversight boards. You know, I'm sure chief within the um, law enforcement, police and community and other cities across America, having a civilian oversight board could be, in my opinion, potentially even be equipped to wearing a mask to protect each other in terms of accountability and ensuring that we have the right behavior and conduct. So I believe that where America is right now, guys, it's the issue and the virus of racism. Yes. In the hands of people with power. Yes. If racism happens in various places across our society. It's not just in police departments. Let's not put all the blame on them. But right. when, how someone uses power if they have implicit bias right or racial tendencies is the equation that we have to break yeah no um, I, I, it I, I, happens it's not I, just I, I, Minneapolis it's I, all I, over the world quite frankly I just, I just want to say something of the history of policing I just want to say something here um racism is all over and as you said it's historic and yep. I think that what is happening right now it's endemic and you have to you know, start at the top because the head of the stream is dirty or, you know, you just have the bottom will not. And the police forces and the leadership in the police forces have to take control, you know, and they have to be able to train their people to understand, the, you know, the, right. uh, there are other, yes, they have to understand the, 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 where they're dealing with, the people that they're dealing with. You know, when we went into an era, for example, we had to call, we had to make sure we had, you know, we dealt with the friendly forces as, um, as um, the judge just said. You have to deal with the people because that there are people living there. You have to try to understand them. And what is happening is that there are many people where there should not be in law enforcement in mm -hmm. the first place. They were not yes. properly. Yes. They were not psychologically evaluated. Yes. They were not, um, you know, trained properly. Trained they properly. The, 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 the precepts and concepts of minimum force and, um, you know, excessive force, et cetera, et cetera. They're not, and they are to be, there are to be terms that they have to abide by. And every year they have to pass certain tests in order to validate themselves. Right and show, and there cannot be people who are moving from one. Ju I was surprised to know that a man who could leave one jurisdiction, having done so many things, and go to another jurisdiction. How is that possible? How could he be hired? You know what I mean? I can hear people have um, warrants on them, have, have things that they have done in the past that they have not disclosed, 
and they become in the highest rank of the police force. Come on, give me a break. And I'm saying to you, I cannot understand how this can happen in plain sight. Not, this is not an indictment on the, the police force. This is an indictment on the entire society. You understand me? So okay, we, we want it. Have to Listen, Dan, I want to say something about that. I want to recognize what Marlon has said. I want to recognize what the, um, the, the, the judge has said. I want to recognize what you said, and I want to recognize what my other colleague, um, um, Chief Sanya said, that we need to understand that we have to change the game, as it was being suggested. Have other institutions that police the police in a nice way, and for them to interact with the civilians in a way that they can understand and know that they are working in their favor. That's my my, my submission. Dan, I agree with I agree with him because that's what I said earlier. The officers need training how to treat people, how to treat civilians, regardless what you have done or not. You cannot treat people just because you want to do an arrest and, and, and treat them that way. Now, let me ask the chief a question. Is she still there? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Let me ask the chief a question. Um, do they do CEUs, like continuing education for officers? Uh, yeah. They do. Um, so they're required, uh, first of all, the officer is cert certified when I'm talking about in Florida, by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So, um, you know, I heard you all mention psychological and exam. So the hiring process is we do a thorough background. Part of that background that they have to take a polygraph examination and they have to take a psychological. So um, the neighborhood checks, I mean, there's a thorough background before they're hired. Um, so we do have that uh, process in place. But as far as their continued education, we do training. Uh, in-house to cover those high liability areas and racial profiling is one, uh, bias-based policing um, is the other, domestic violence. So every four years, and this is just what is required by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, they have to uh, go through this 40-hour course. I just did one uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, if not, they'll lose their certification. So in addition to that training, which is required for them to maintain the certification, we do additional training. Um, I know we talked about dealing with people that have mental issues, crisis intervention training. The officers go through that. They go through de-escalation training. Um, in fact, I'm going to reiterate, and, and you know, I know we, somebody mentioned earlier about the policies or use of force policy. We went over that policy. The officers have to sign up on it, not just sign up on it, but it's also explained by the supervisor to make sure they understand or they have questions. So we did go over our policy um, to make sure that everybody understood. Even though they signed off and read it on it before, we made sure we, we reiterated that. There are high liability areas, and that is one when it comes to use of force, that we have to make sure we're on point. So, um, you know, to answer your question, yes. The officers do have to go through uh, certain training. They go through firearms training. They go through de-escalation training. And I'm looking into providing some additional training um, as it relates to, you know, what we're dealing with now. But let me ask something. Uh, let me ask another Senator, question, uh, Chief. Yes, let me ask another question. Can you hold just a second, Please. Senator? I need to to pause for just okay, a minute. Go ahead. Um, we do have viewers, <laughs> and as healthy and as passionate as we all are about this, we definitely want to get some viewers' input as well and their questions to you. Um, yes, additional training is great. I'm talking from my gut and as a human being, it still holds people to being accountable. No matter how much training you give them, people have to make choices. So me knowing that a police officer went through training right now in today's temperature, when people can freely pick up a phone and call, and let's use the example that was done, a white woman, Amy Cooper, call the police on a hysterical that a man in the park who simply asked her to put a leash on a dog um, was harassing her. Now, God forbid, had that cop, those cops come, what the outcome was. And that's what the, the, the cries of America are right now is we are scared if a police officer comes to our door um, imagine women that are in abusive situations would be afraid to call the police mm -hmm. because they would rather be with their abuser than deal with a police that may drag their black husband, boyfriend out 
and they don't know the outcome of that. That's the real fear. So I think overall, the entire system, and, and I see like New Haven police or New Hampshire police, they did a whole oath in public trying to swear to, to the people that they're, they're bound to protect and serve, that they are gonna make choices. So at the end of the day, we want human beings that are gonna make choices that are in power. But with that said, let's get to some questions from the audience. So for everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to this passionate conversation that we must have and we will continue to have because it's not a one day conversation. So Paula Haas said, accountability is key. And because for so long, there has been none, the issues continue within our communities. There has to be dialogue with the leaders of our communities law enforcement and its citizens. And of course, the missing link, the lack of an effective leader in our mm -hmm. presidency. Mm. So Paula, thank you for that comment because that's on the minds of every citizen, um, well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of our citizens are saying, where's our president uh, during this time? Um, you know, Listen. we've seen, give us a second, Senator. We've seen where, you know, there's been some, whether people agree or disagree, because, you know, people will, but the president has stepped out and made comments about, you know, dispersing the military on U.S. citizens. He has um, had photo ops, and to have those photo ops in front of the church, which the church has clearly denounced that he did it, mm -hmm. to clear his path. You know, he, he sprayed those citizens and they shot pallets at them just to clear them, the protesters that were there. And so tell us from your point of view, what is your stance or how do you feel the president of the United States of America has handled this situation? Hmm. Marlon, let's hear from Marlon for, <laughs> for this one. Um, when, I, when I look at Keith Stanley, and following her career. Um, before she became a, um, a chief, she was someone else. Huh. Was someone with an upbringing, someone with a family, someone with a worldview, someone with an education. Before she got the title of chief, or even before she was sworn in as a police officer. In the same way, before someone became president and the commander in chief, they have the same values, upbringing, schooling, and they bring that to the leadership position. This is why the choice of leadership is so important. Whether it's to, we can't depend solely on the commander in chief when we have various chiefs across the country that will be giving him too much credit um, even though his office comes with a certain power. You have to separate the power from the person who has the power. That is the problem when there's an interaction with a law enforcement police officer and a citizen. Right, because there's two regular citizens, one with power and one supposedly without power, but a citizen is not without power. A citizen is not without power in de-escalating a situation or escalating a situation. So the issue, Don, of accountability cuts both ways. It's when the power is abused, even with the commander in chief, that's when it stinks. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you for that. Judge Hemming? Yeah, so, so one of the interesting things is that on August the 9th, 2014, there was a different president um, in power at the time. There was a killing of this young man by the name of Michael Brown. The killing of Michael Brown in Missouri was the impetus for the 21st century policing plan. That was the outgrowth of that, this need to affect all these 18 policing um, agencies. Um, one of the things that, that, that I'd like to point out, I think that I think that all of us should think about is that um, sometimes we look too much to the person who is sitting in the White House in Washington and trying to figure out um, how to solve our problems. When uh, th there's a saying, what, 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 did it, what does it say? It says, aluta continua. It says, power, power to the people. L listen, we have come a far way as a people, but we have a far way yet to go. But change is coming, and change has come. Listen, there was a, there was a young man named Emmett Till um, who was murdered 
right? Because it said that he, he they, they thought at the time that he had raped or touched this um, white woman um, in, in the South. He was beaten that he was unrecognizable. And his mother said, let us have an open casket. You see, this is going to sound strange for a judge to say this, but, but I, I don't have a problem with, with uh, protesting and protesters. I do have a problem with looting, but no problem with protesting and protesters. You see, change comes, th th there, there would be no change in America by just having Martin Luther King. There was, there was the, you needed a change. Part of the change was having Malcolm there at the same time. And for all of you people, since this is a Caribbean edge, as you know, one of the last books that uh, Martin Luther King wrote um, was, Where Do I Go From Here? Um, Chaos or Community. That book was actually written in Ocho Rios, Jamaica. But Malcolm X, by the way, also has a Caribbean connection for the Caribbean edge. Um, Malcolm X, you see, uh, his mother was from um, Grenada. And, and his father was an avid follower of the United Negro Improvement Association um, of our Jamaican Marcus um, Garvey. So, so that's why I'm not surprised that we have all of these people from Caribbean backgrounds, from Haiti and Jamaica and Grenada and from all over um, participating this evening on the Caribbean edge, uh, Dawn, and I salute you for, for doing that. But I say all of that to say this, that a luta continua, the power resides with us as people, regardless of the position that you're in. If you're a judge, if you're a police chief, if you're a state senator, if you're a commissioner in, in Miami-Dade County, if you're a professor at a university, all of us have to work together to make sure that in our area of influence, in our sphere of influence, we're making sure that the things that have happened in the past by our predecessors don't happen uh, while on, it's on our watch, right? So we need to all commit to say, listen, I'm gonna make sure the next generation can grieve. I'm gonna make sure that the next generation doesn't have to put up with the killing of a George Floyd and leave behind a six-year-old daughter and, 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 and an adult um, son. Um, being killed in the street in, in, under circumstances that, as the state commission, the state um, senator told us, is worse than how you would kill a dog. Can, can I just say this? That um, I would like to say that leadership is a thing that, you know, it's, some of us are born leaders, some of us, most of us are made leaders. But one thing is, a uh, motto is the leadership by example, exemplo ducimus. That was the motto of the Royal Military Police Training School. Um, force, as it were. So we have to have leaders with the qualities of leadership that display the qualities of leadership. And, you know, a lot of people think that the military, for example, or the military police or whatever, was just shoot, shoot, shoot. No. It, the, the nine principles of war, the first one is good communications. The second one is maintaining momentum. And the third one, which I think is the key, is flexibility. If you do not have leaders who can communicate properly, who can promote, they communicate their ideas, who can see that the people are human, who can hmm. see leaders of any kind in the Senate, anywhere we are sitting here, we're all leaders here tonight. We have to make sure. And you know, I am supporting a man for Broward County. His name is Andrew Smalling. And I know some of you have heard of him. And the fact is, why am I doing that? Because he was a military man, because I've seen what he has done. And to be truthful, he's Jamaican, I'm sorry. I'm Jamaican, I'm born and bred, and I'll be Jamaican until I did. But the fact of the matter is, I think, and I love Haitians too, so don't, don't, don't not look at me, Miss D. But the fact of the matter is that we need to understand that we are human beings, there are human beings out there, and we need to empathize with them and do the right thing. And I am not supporting anyone who does not offer the type of leadership that has integrity, that is, um, uh, has vision, and has depth. And that's my view on the whole matter. Thank you. And Judge Hemming, I thank you for that as well. Um, the power is in the people, and that is so powerful, because I'm learning from you as well. And that's why I put myself on the spot to explain what I went through and the steps I took, because I think it's so powerful to educate our communities that we hold the power to make a difference. It didn't make a difference for all the people that have died when there are no cameras around. Wow. For the people that are living and are being treated unfairly, please reach out and make that complaint because it makes the difference. And I want to go to some more statements or questions. I just, I just want to say before I go that I want to commend these leaders on Marlon Hill, Chief, um, Judge, 
and um, the senator that on your work that you have been doing and the expressions that your people should love you and continue to do so because you have real people on this. And congratulations, Dawn. Before Thank you. I, I forget. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Okay. So Karen, can you give can you let me say one thing before you start, please? One thing. Let me say something to all of you. Leadership, you cannot buy leadership. Leadership earned. Yeah. Once you are a leader, you are a leader. You cannot buy it. This is why it's very, very important, Don, for us now with this situation, with pandemic crisis, with this George issue, to make sure August 18 we vote for the right people because our president needs to go, period. So this is why, you know, it's good to have dialogue like this to put good people leadership with leadership skill with proven result with people you know who could be accountable when they do something wrong people who could be transparent people who has been there for the people who understand what is called human beings people who could be involved with the community let them know what is going on and be there for the people and for the people right and i agree with you leadership you know is, is not something you can buy. However, there are a lot of people in power that have been bought. And that mm -hmm. be, being in those positions is why we're having these conversations today. People in the wrong positions, not just police officers alone, but people that are put in a powerful situation of authority that yes. make decisions on our day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, I really want to read a lot of what people are saying because that's the reason that they tune in is to have their two cents as well. So Carol Ross David, thanks for your comment. She said, good luck with doing the same old thing in the new 21st century, hire right people and hold people accountable, which is what you just referenced to Senator. So thank you for that. And I'm not sure who this is towards, but she says, sir, with all due respect, you cannot train for respect, respect and integrity. We have reliable personality testing that will reflect that shame. Um, um, Gwendolyn Watford, who's also a nurse, she says, a registered nurse, she says, exactly, you cannot train a mindset. You set limits and boundaries through policies and procedures and hold them accountable immediately for violations. And those are the things, you know, for law enforcement that regular citizens are looking towards. The change, when you have police officers with all these complaints, whether it's an independent panel that's looking at these complaints, what is the change that's gonna be made? Is every person in power, whether you're a judge, a, a police officer, police chief, are we all looking at ourselves and saying, what can I do to make change? Because what's in place right now is not working. It hasn't worked. I know I've personally reflected to say, why have I sat silent? What, what am I? I think our youth are actually stepping forward and protesting and making more of an impact and a change than a lot of us have done. And, and that's what you're here to say what changes are you going to do because obviously i will vote for every one of you on this panel you have my vote but we want change we don't want the same old thing like you know one of our viewers commented because it's not working so how do you impact that change has anyone thought about how you're going to make a change within your control okay. Well, first of all, um, I want to say that I, I enjoy what I do. Um, I've uh, made sure that I put per certain people in the right places. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we do have community programs, community outreach programs. Uh, we have community liaisons, and we uh, often partner with the, the pastors um, in this area. Sometimes outside of uh, the city of Lauderhill, we meet, try to address some of their issues. Um, one of the things I, I do want to say, though, when it comes to our, our young uh, folks, um, it is so important because, you know, when it comes to mentoring, I don't think there's enough mentors out there. 
Um, we do have um, uh, one of our schools, and, and I have to commend one of the counselors from the schools, but she recognized that need and reached out to not only uh, you know, the police department, but several other you know, judges, um, several other people to see if they can uh, participate in this. And there were about, she had a list of about 99 kids who were on that list that wanted mentors, but she only had about 50. And I said, it shouldn't be. So um, I'm proud to say that I am a mentor, uh, you know, and I've been one for the last three years. Um, and this last uh, school session, unfortunately school was out, but that didn't stop them from still engaging with the kids. Um, about eight officers, and, and I, may be, I may be a little uh, low in that number, are mentors as well. So they don't just mentor the kids, but they take them out, um, you know, spend time with them. I took uh, the young lady that I mentored to a movie theater, you know, um, took her to see shows, you know, so we, we engage a lot. Sometimes pick her up from the school and take her to lunch. So again, it's important to really bond with these uh, young people. What I've often seen in the past, and I, I talked to the parents about it, but I may, you know, walk into a situation, I see someone with the kid, and I hear the parents say, there's a police, I'm gonna have them take you to jail. And I talk to that parent, I say, please don't tell them that because you're, you're encouraging them to hate police. Then I'll direct my attention to that kid. And I'll say to them, you know, how are you? Sometimes I keep changing my pocket and I'll maybe pull out a dollar or something and give it to them and have that conversation with them. But I don't want them to look at us um, in one way. So I've always, I'm, I'm very big when it comes to customer service, uh, when it comes to people, you know, if, if I have somebody sitting in the lobby and I happen to walk through there. How long have you been sitting here? You know, so it's letting people know that they're important um, and you have to display that. When I'm out in the community, when we attend these community events, I tell my officer to engage, not just amongst yourself, but let's get out and talk to the, the folks to get them, you know, so they can get to know you. So again, it's making sure that we hold people accountable. I do that often. Um, again, I mentioned that we have people that should not be in this profession. And you have to deal with that. You know, you have to, to get rid of that source. They may pass a poly, they may pass the psychological exam, but again, um, they get through that process. But if you have a person that's continuing doing things that and you have to deal with it, you have to address it and you have to get rid of them. You know, again, that's the only way we're gonna resolve this. Having the uh, community as a whole, getting the judges involved, um, you know, just, just uh, having every, everyone involved. Um, and that's what it's gonna take. And we appreciate that. We are so thankful that you're on here to tell us what you're doing and how customer service, how much it means to you, because that's so powerful. We thank you for that, because you also put your life at risk every day for us. So thank you. We're watching where even with all the cameras going, um, we watched on the news with two young college kids being pulled out of a car in Atlanta. Those could have been my children, just happened to be in traffic. I mean, it has to stop the pain of parents. I have friends that call me that say, Dawn, I cry every day. Before I came on the show tonight, a friend of mine said she sat at a traffic light and she just cried and she lives in Atlanta. Our mothers are crying, our fathers are crying. So we, you know, even though you're the panel that's here having the conversation with us, it's a conversation for our entire world. What happened is impacting us because they're protesters supporting the, the, the youth and all the parents that are out there saying enough is enough. We can't sit by anymore and just file a complaint when we're being killed. You know, we have white people, and I hate using these terms. I didn't grow up using the terms black and white. It's, it's so unnatural for me personally. But white people are reaching out to black people, some of them, and saying, what can I do? So, you know, there are white people out there protesting and being abused in these protests as well, supporting the cause, but not everyone is. Some people- well, One of the things that we can do is yeah. that um, our National Museum of African American History and Culture has a great um, link on the homepage right now, a conversation about race. And yes. there are resources there for parents, there are resources there for community leaders, there are resources there for employers, 
for us to act, kind of open up this, this virus. I consider it a virus, really. Um, and unless we work together to find a prescription or a vaccine for it, the impact of the virus is going to continue to happen. You know, and some police departments are better at protecting the virus from internally and, in, and externally in their communities. Um, and depending on the state that you go to or the city that you go to, every organization, in my opinion, as a business lawyer, I've learned over the years, Dawn, is that has a culture. Family has a culture. Um, nonprofit organizations have a culture. Governments have a culture. A city has a culture. And we have to help. We have to nurture healthier relationships, black, white, or indifferent within our communities if we are going to mitigate the impact of this virus called racism, which transcends generations. Sociologists and anthropologists will tell you, um, irrespective of the country that you have, that you, it's learned behavior that's part of the culture. And you have to actively do certain things to remove the virus of racism. So we have to do a better job of building relationships with our police officers. Police officers have to do a better job of meeting the community where it is. As a county commissioner, I, I will tell you that I, I will definitely be prioritizing the way in which the police department for Miami-Dade County is conducting its training, is conducting you know, its, the policies and the, 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 the continuing education of implicit bias. Um, and even looking at ways in which to put, to put, to, to create an environment where if there is a need for a civilian oversight board, that is not just something against the officers, it's also for the benefit of the community. It, it's supposed to go to both ways in terms of accountability and the whole of it is structured as they are well over, no man, how many civilian oversight boards there are? Well over a hundred. Yeah, no, no, no. Across the, across the country, yeah. you have to look at a model that's combat, compatible with the community that it's being employed. Can I say this too? I want to say that um, in all of this, we have to really also um, train, um, look at our children and, and maybe teach them how to communicate too and so on. There's, sometimes we have some preformed com, um, complexes as well. And, um, we, and we're responsible. We have to be responsible. We have to train them to respons be responsible too and be aware. Um, you know, I've seen some, some behavior in the protest though. And many, uh, many uh, uh, the ladies, sorry, but um, you know, the way they were, th these protesters were behaving, I'm saying to myself, my God, um, you know, I have girls in college and so on and so forth. Um, would they be doing this? Um, you know, in fact, I chose a college for my daughter because I didn't want her to be doing that. Uh, you know, and, um, and it, it's just, she came out of magna cum laude. As a result, she just graduated at 22. So the point I'm trying to make is this, that we have to find a way to make these people understand our culture, where we're coming from, that we are coming from kings and queens and, and you know, um, a, a good stock, you know, and that we have to maintain that and we have to prepare the next generation for the fact that we um, are, are, are worthy and not because somebody has said so because they have a different color, because we are worthy, because we, we, we love ourselves and we want to do the best for ourselves. We must not condone bad behavior and we must make sure that, you know, and there is bad behavior at times. There are times for, um, you know, the, 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 I think the um, parable says there's a time for uh, a peace and there's a time for war, there's a time for love and there's a time to hate. But the fact of the matter is it looks like we are getting the wrong side of hate. Everything that is bad is black. Everything, you know, I, Malcolm, Ma, 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 you know, Ma, Muhammad said, Ali said the best, I'm going to stop here. You know, when you grew up, everything you saw, there was a white God, white angels, and you know, and when it came to everything, it was a black devil, it was, everything was black. Now, when you are, you, you have this preformed, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're ingrained in your mind that these things, and I found it terrible, you know, to, 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 to be as an adult and as a kid. And I knew that I had to do something about it. I need, we need for our children to understand that they are the leaders of tomorrow and they have to take the responsibility from now and they have to behave likewise, you know? And, and that's all I'm saying, uh, you know, right now. Thank you. The, 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 the reason that I'm excited, Don, if I may say this, about the situation that's going on now is that in the midst of all of what seems like chaos, there are all of these bright spots. You see, those same two students who in Atlanta who were tased and taken out of their car and mistreated um, in a disgusting fashion by the police department, they were just about, they were about 17 miles west of Stone Mountain, which was the place that the Ku Klux Klan 
called their home that Martin Luther King spoke about um, in his speech. But, but in 2020, the mayor of that city called Atlanta was an African-American female. And right after that happened to those two students, these six officers who were involved were separated from duty. See, there's, there's a change in America that's coming. I believe that there's a change in America that's coming because of someone by the name of, not, it wasn't a, she wasn't a judge, she wasn't a state senator, she wasn't a county commissioner, she wasn't some college professor, and she wasn't some judge. It was a 17-year-old girl. Her name is Darnella Frazier. Because of her, we are here today talking about this issue, I, I can't breathe. Because this little 17-year-old girl stood up. She, she understood that there was power in the, with the people and that she could make a change. And so she recorded for eight minutes and 43 seconds the death of George Floyd, despite being threatened, despite the, at, risk, at the risk of her own life, she continued recording and then released it. Otherwise, we would never even have known what, what had happened to this um, poor man. So I, I believe that there is hope for America. I believe that change is coming. Why else do I believe that in hope for America? Because I, when I look at the footage of the demonstrations during the time of Martin Luther King, I, I saw white people out demonstrating. However, in 2020, there are more whites, more Asians, more Hispanics um, who have joined the lines of protest all across the United States of America, in all 50 states. So I, and, and I hear my friends who, are, who don't look like me, who don't have the amount of melanin that I have, they're all asking me the same question. Norman, what can we do to help? So mm -hmm. I believe that change is coming to America. And I believe that all of these horrible things that have happened, that have brought us, all these deaths that have brought us to this point where we are, are gonna be a force for change um, in this country and that we will go forward from here better than we were in 2019. And I really do believe that. I believe that we will be able to breathe again. And I agree with you. Thank you for that. I'm glad you mentioned her because she did get negative comments, but what she did was beyond powerful because it's changed in history. And I'm a huge supporter of with every tragic situation, what can we learn from it? How do we grow from it? So I do want to ask everyone, because I think we've gone almost an hour and a half, to just give your final thoughts, what your plans are, how are you going to impact change? We'll start with Senator. Well, um, to conclude with all the discussion we just had earlier, and uh, I believe if we need changes, we need to show, you know, ourselves at the poll because we had election now, August 18, and we have, that's primary elections, and we have November's coming, which is going to be presidential election too. So a lot of people sometimes says they don't vote, they only vote for president. They don't vote for local government, they don't vote for state government, only president. But I told them all the time, when you need something, you have to start it from the local to the state before you reach, you know, a White House. So in that said, this election 2020 is extremely important for we as a Caribbean and for everybody in general to know this is not an election to take it lightly. This is not an election to say, oh, I don't like so, so, and so. You have to know who you're voting for. You have to know the person you're voting for. The person could be, uh, have to be accountable. They have to have integrity. They have to have leadership skill with prevent results. They have to be involved with the community. And you, they have, you have to know what they're going to do for you. How they're gonna you're gonna choose? Let's say you choose Senator Campbell to Tallahassee. What changes can you do for me at the set level, especially in a situation like this? Well, my changes. Let me tell you. Number one, stand your ground law needs to be changed. Period. Justice reform need to be done immediately. What happened now? That officer who kneeled down on the 
George Floyd neck should be arrested right on the spot and lose all his benefits right on the spot, given some consequences so others officer would know they have consequences on the table for them, so they won't do the same. Even those, the other three who stood there watching what happened, still free, they have to wait for protests. They have to it's protest all over the world just for this. No, we need policy in place for officers. When they do something, their consequences should be right at the spot until they're proven guilty and you strip them away of all their benefits. Whatever benefits they have is gone. This is what I'm gonna work in Tallahassee. Once the District 35 resident choose me, I will make sure we I have a bill in place to correct the is this issue. So Miss uh, Madam Chief, you don't have to worry. I will make sure something is done for the community something is done for the people and things like that don't repeat again enough is enough we are tired of hearing every day black and white white and black we have to have strict policy good policy in place for things like that never happen and make sure make sure everyone who listening to us right now to go and vote and vote for the right people. Vote for the one who's going to be there for you. Vote for the one you know who's going to change, who's going to really make a good change. Vote for someone with integrity, with uh, accountability, with transparency. Vote, vote, vote. Once we do that, trust me, the whole, the world will change, and changes will change what happened after August 18 and after November 2020. Thank you, God bless, and the Caribbean edge. Miss Dan, I love you, and you're doing a great job. Continue the good job, but don't forget Miss Dan, you need to vote also, and vote for the one. You going, like the officer, as soon he kills someone, he handcuffed right away. Don't give him no time to breathe. The same way he didn't let Joy Flood to breathe, we don't give him no time to breathe. You lock him up right on the spot, and all three of them, enough is enough, and we will see the change by the grace of God. We will see the change in November by the grace of God, removing the president who do not, is not mine, it's not mine because he's not doing the right thing because up to now, I haven't heard his voice, you know, with what's going on. So please, guys, be safe out there. The pandemic still in process. Have your mask. Have your gloves. Stay with the, the distance, six feet distancing from someone else. Be safe. And may God bless everyone watching, everyone listening, and may God bless the whole entire panel, the judge, the chief. Chief, don't be discouraged. I know you're a good chief. I know you're doing a great job. I have a lot of chiefs who are my friends, a lot of chiefs. I honor I honored a lot of chiefs. So yeah. I do know. You're not bad like, like, like that one who killed Joy Flood. But you are the great one. Continue, and may God bless you. I know your work is hard. I know when you go out there, you don't even know if you're not gonna go, go back home. I do know you underpay. I do know you need to go and even go to college or university to, you know, like a, a, a pursuit, you know, your higher degree. You cannot because the pay they give you is not enough for you to pay for your kids' colleges, for your kids, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, continue education. Please don't, I know it's hard. But be encouraged. Thank you for Thank your question. Thank you for being out in the street protesting and for all the love and your service to the community. We're going to ask Chief Stanley for her parting words. What would you like to, to tell the viewers as this will be shared around the world? Hey, thank you, Don. I first want to uh, applaud you for having this forum. Um, I appreciate you inviting me out. Um, I appreciate all the uh, guest speakers. I learned a lot from all of you. Um, I hope we will be having conversations um, again. Um, again, um, I know it was only what time did we start at uh, 7.30. Still not enough time. 
we have to continue these conversations. Um, this is a start and, and we need to make sure it happens. Um, <clears throat> but first of all, we have to continue um, as a leader to lead by example. Um, I'm very passionate about uh, you know, community involvement. It is necessary. We do have to hold officers accountable. Um, again, we have di uh, different uh, procedures and processes in place. So we have to make sure we do that. And again, if somebody is not abiding by policy, if someone is uh, not professional, they're abusive, and if they feel that their own biases will interfere how they interact with the community, they need to turn in the badge. Um, you know, again, there are very uh, decent cops out there. <clears throat> when I can sit here and tell you the stories of how many things that these officers do, uh, where they come out of their pocket, and if there's a kid that needs a bike, you know, they're, they're willing to do that. Someone who's a victim of a burglary, um, you know, they go out if they had a television missing or whatever it is, they go out and purchase these. A lot of times I don't even hear about them. I hear about them later, either by way of letter from the community or by someone else who mentioned that. So there's a lot of good cops and I really don't want this incident. You know, although it's something that we need to, to, to wake up and make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, but I don't want it to impact a lot of the great things that officers are doing out there. So again, we have to make sure that those who are violating the law, um, they don't, they, they lose their certification. So we have to get with Florida Department of Law Enforcement, you know, to make sure whatever procedures or, you know, uh, processes they have in place, we don't have these officers who continue to do to, uh, bad behavior to go from agency to agency. Again, we have a very strenuous process. I have a, uh, um, uh, a lot of openings right now. So I encourage people in the community that want to make a change. And that was one of the things that I did to join the force. Um, we have high numbers because we have high expectations. So, you know, just because our numbers are, are, are high and we need more personnel, I'd rather be that way um, than to just hire anyone. So again, we have to make sure we go do a thorough and, and complete background uh, before we look to hire uh, folks. And I'm gonna leave with this. This is something that as growing up as a child, I don't know who the author is, um, but my mom used to always tell us. So right now we all have a job to do and it's a task. So when a task has once been done, never leave until it's done. Be the labor, great or small, do it well or not at all. So I want to encourage everyone to do your part and let's make a change, it's necessary. Thank you. Okay. And, and I'm so glad you point out, we don't want to lose sight of, we do have law enforcement in place for a reason. And there are officers, despite what people want to hear right now, there are officers that are doing the right thing, mm -hmm. um, that are protecting and serving that we do need. We just need to weed out the ones that are corrupt and uh, that are causing the negativity within our society. So thank you for being one of them and for being able to support your police um, station um, and, and share some of the good things that they do out there. Thank you for that and for joining us tonight. Marlon Hill. Hmm. Um, you know, we, we have to really be mindful of our, our, our mental health at this point, right? To make sure that we go into the world to enforce the contract of America. Um, somewhere that says something like, all men are created equal with certain inalienable rights, right? Um, and we still, we're still working towards that contract and the fulfillment of that contract. Um, you know, when our law firm decided to adopt Brownsville Middle School to establish that law academy, the first thing that we gave to the kids in the law academy in the middle school was the Constitution with a book. You know, and we need to really embrace the fact of talking more to our kids. There's not an invitation that I get to go to a middle school if my schedule permits to go and talk to kids. Kids need to see us. They need to hear us, chiefs, lawyers, judges, bailiffs, um, senators, nurses. They need to be able to learn these types of values because the only way that we're going to break the spread of this virus that, that infiltrates into halls and hands of power is that you have to change the culture in which it is cultivated. This is in feeds on 
on, on people who receive it. It's like a virus, right? So you have to break the culture. You know, so each person that's listening tonight, I want to thank you for joining this program and spending time with us online. Thank you, Dawn and, and Caribbean Edge. You, are, you, know, you guys are a treasure. But every single person listening here tonight, whether you're a parent or you are an employer or an employee, whatever role that you have in the world, you have a lane that you can walk in and you can really have an impact on your local community. One of the first things that I want you to do tomorrow is to pick up the phone and call your chief or send a letter to your chief or an email or a fax to your chief and, and, and try to develop a relationship of accountability, not just for the chief and her rank and file, but your extended family, because we have a responsibility too to build healthy communities as well. And as long as we do both, Don, I think that we'll do a better job of trying to rid this world of the abuse of power and racism, which is really the problem for what we're seeing locally here in the United States. And it's, you see the impact of it in other parts of the world. It's not just Jermaine. This virus is not, did not start in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Period, full stop. Thank you, Marlon. And I know you as well have come on the Caribbean Edge and talked about the importance of voting. So please support Marlon Hill as well, because I know he will make the change that's necessary within your community and our world, because we impact the world with our choices. So thank you, Marlon, for joining us tonight. Dr. Rupert Francis. Yes, so I, would like to, I would like to state that um, leadership is important and who we choose as our leaders is very, very important because they're supposed to lead the way. Tonight, we are very lucky to have in our midst some leaders who are setting the pace for the future leaders. The state senator, um, the chief of police, herself a leader in her community, Marlon Hill, who I've known, and his principles that he has outlined for his, um, the, for his jurisdiction. And also Judge Hemmings, who have been active. I'm not a leader per se, or aspiring to be a political leader, but I support all political leaders who really um, and honestly want to serve the people, serve the people in such a way that they will have good leadership, that they can have good um, outcomes from their leadership, and they will not um, they will not play with the rule of law. They will not play with their role as and, and they're accountable and transparent. And they would make sure that the job of leadership is done. I am backing uh, someone for sure. I will. I, I'm making that absolutely clear because I see those qualities in that person. In the he's not here this evening, but I'm hoping that he'll be here in the future. And that is former Chief Andrew Smalling of Lauder Hill. I have been intimately involved in the whole communities, all of these communities. And one thing I'm going to ask, but let us collaborate, as the Senator said, from the east to the west, north to the south. Make sure we co collaborate with each other because united we stand, divided we fall. So, you know, it might be a cliche, but I'm telling you this we have to be strong in ourselves and strong in each other and never waver because without, because you know, if we, we are divided, we will definitely be exploited, as um, uh, the man called Lynch had done um, in the early days of slavery. Thank you very much for listening. And thanks for having me as a part of this wonderful panel. Thank you, Dawn. You're so gracious. We're so glad to have you because you bring so much knowledge and wealth and so well spoken. And thank you once again for our opening um, prayer. And yes, Andrew Smalling, phenomenal. Um, we wish he was here, but once again, his apologies for not being here. He had an emergency. And we move on to Norman Hemmings, our judge of the panel here, with his, his, your closing words with us tonight. Hi. Uh, we started off this evening talking about, I can't breathe. But breathing has a lot to do with um, the exchange of oxygen um, in the red blood cells. Um, to the capillaries um, in, our, in our bodies. And um, it's not lost on me that on this day, on this June the 3rd, is also the day, the birthday of Dr. Charles Drew, an African-American 
who, in, who put together and invented uh, the method of storing uh, blood plasma separate from um, red blood cells so that we can have bl um, blood banks so that people at the end of World War II were able to breathe so that we today in 2020 are able to breathe and have uh, transfusion. And also not lost in me that the rest of my life I pledge that although I'm, never, I'm not running for office and I'm not in an elected office, I pledge to you that I will continue to work for the enforcement of the 21st century uh, policing plan that came out in 2015. But I, I see a bright hope for America and a bright hope for the Caribbean community. And I, I don't endorse any candidate, right? Because I have to stay away from that, otherwise I get fired and I need the money for my children. Right? Just, however, I will say this to you. These are great times in America. You see, because this is the Caribbean edge, and coming up um, in November of this year, we have two women of Caribbean heritage on the short list of the presumptive uh, nominee for the, for the Democratic Party, who are possibly gonna be the next vice president of the United States, if the Democrats win. Uh, but even if they don't win, I'll still continue to work hard, right? Because I don't, uh, uh, not endorsing anyone. However, I will say this, both of them are, have Caribbean parents. Both Susan Rice, who is on the short list with, Jamaica, with a Jamaican parent, and also Kamala Harris with a Jamaican uh, father. And um, I believe that great times are ahead because just like uh, Malcolm X had a Caribbean heritage in the island of Grenada, just like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and his connection to Jamaica, just like Marcus Garvey and his connection uh, to the Caribbean and uh, to Jamaica. I believe that great times are coming, not just for black people, but for all of us as Americans, whether we are Haitian Americans, whether we're Grenadian Americans, Jamaican Americans, whether we're European Americans, great times are coming for our country because this generation, these people that are called by the name of someone like a Darnella Fraser, Darnella means a hidden nook. I believe that there are hidden nooks all throughout the white, the black, the Hispanic, the Asian community who are getting ready to rise up, who will do a much better job of making America live up to the dream that Marlon Hill spoke about and that all the forefathers envisioned it uh, to be. I believe that once again, we will be able to dream. Thank you, Don Wilson, for allowing us the freedom to have this talk, to breathe this evening on the Caribbean edge. For you Caribbean people, I can't wait to see the changes you're gonna make as chief, as state senator, as uh, Miami-Dade commissioner, and, and well, whoever wins, I can't wait to see what's going to happen in America when you continue you. the long tradition of great Caribbean people. God bless you. One love. Big up to all of you. You always make me smile. <laughs> and I thank you for that. You're such a delight. And what a, a wonderful closing statement just to sum up everything, all the passion, the energy of everyone here tonight. I encourage everyone to go on the Caribbean edge and respond because there's probably a lot of comments that we didn't get to. Like we've mentioned, this is just not a one night conversation. It's just the beginning. And then my closing words goes to the beloved Bob Marley from his song, which was released in 1976. It says, until the philosophy which holds one race superior to another, is permanently discredited and abandoned, abandoned everywhere is war. That until there is no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, until a, the color of a man's skin is no longer significant than the color of his eyes. That until basic human rights and equality guaranteed to all without regards to race, this is war. And he says, we will win the confident in victory of good over evil. So thank you all for your, your expertise tonight, your passion, and your promise to make change, not only in your professions, but as humans, as mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, uncles, nieces, nephews. Thank you from the Caribbean Edge. Good night. Thank our viewers for tuning in again to the Caribbean Edge. Good night. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Of course, that person. Thank you all. <laughs> all righty. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Keep in touch. Bye bye. I don't even know how to come off this. <laughs>
Oh, Lord, help us. Okay. Okay. <laughs>